Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Our subject today is Cyrano de Bergerac. A few words by way of introduction. The author was Edmund Rostand, 1868 to 1918. And Ayn Rand once observed that his death in the flu epidemic after World War I symbolized the end of the individualist era of which he was a superlatively eloquent representative. He was born in Provence to a wealthy, educated French family, got a law degree in Paris, and then turned to literature for his main creative life. He did some early work, including a play and some poetry that are not too important, and then seemingly out of the blue came his masterpiece, Cyrano, which was finished just three years short of a century ago in 1897 when he was only 29 and at the time unknown except by a few literati in Paris. Uh, His play, Cyrano, is a work of unbelievable genius. It's also Rostand's high point. He only wrote two really significant plays afterwards, Leglon about the son of Napoleon and Chanticleer, a play which is set in a barnyard with animal characters. And these works, in my opinion, whatever their merits, do not come close to equaling Cyrano. Few plays do. Now, for such a romantic play as this, you may be surprised to learn that it's based on the life of an actual 17th century Frenchman named, do you know what? Cyrano de Bergerac, whom Rostand researched thoroughly. This actual Cyrano was born in 1619 and died in 1655 at the age of 36. And he was the basis for many details in the play. Now listen to this, he was a playwright. This is the real Cyrano. He was a playwright, a scholar, a Gascon, a soldier, a duelist. He wrote the first science fiction ever, and it pertained to a journey to the moon, and that's where Rostand got the idea of Cyrano making up those devices to get to the moon. There was a real Montfleury, and the real Cyrano ordered him off the stage. He died by being hit on the head by a log of wood. He had a friend, Lebray, a cousin, Roxanne, and there was even another soldier at the time who was a, like a stand-in for Christian. The real Cyrano had a gargantuan nose, <clears throat> and he was generally described in, in histories as headlong, independent, abrasive, assertive, unconventional, and confrontational. So you see how very, very much Rostand got from real life. But what Rostand supplied was something that real life did not, the plot the values, and thus the meaning to all these facts. In actual history, there was no friendship between Cyrano and Christian, no plot between them to woo Roxanne, and above all, in real life history, Cyrano was not in love with Roxanne. So the actual facts, although they're close in so many particulars, just sit there and affect no one. It is Rostand whose creative mind gave them a meaning, gave the characters a passionate purpose and conflicts, and thus made their story immortal. Now, the story, as you know, is set in the 17th century France of the real Cyrano. The first four acts in 1640, and the fifth 15 years later in 1655. And if you know anything about the period, this was the time of Le Cid by Corneille, Uh, This was the time Descartes was writing his famous works, the French Academy was being founded, this was the era of Cardinal Richelieu. It was the exciting new France of the late Renaissance, France of the emerging modern world. Cyrano the play opened in Paris on December 28, 1897 and was a tremendous success. It will do your heart good to think that here was a historical justice. One commentator describes it as follows. On the opening, quote, on the opening night, uh, Rostand was overcome with nervousness and overwhelmed with surprise. And this is actually true. A half hour before the curtain arose, he apologized to the company 
for having involved them in what was sure to be a disastrous failure. Two hours after the curtain had been rung down, the audience was still in the theater, still applauding and still calling for the author. The great French actor Coquelin, who created the title role, describes the scene as follows. Quote, there is but one phrase to express the enthusiasm at our first performance, a house in delirium alone gives any idea what took place. After each act, the entire audience would rise to its feet, shouting and cheering for 10 minutes at a time. The dressing rooms were packed by the critics and the author's friends who were beside themselves with delight. I've had to cut for time, but you get the idea. The play went on immediately to become a smashing international success, and one commentator writes, quote, no other play in history before or since has ever attained a popular success so instantaneous and so enormous. Now, there's many reasons why, uh, but one reason is that it is a truly great romantic play, and it is one of the last of the great romantic plays in Western cultural history. That alone makes it timeless, invaluable, and desperately needed. And it's romantic in all the key attributes. Life, figures who are larger than life, driven by long-range purposes, purposeful plot, lyrical style, exalted, uplifted sense of life. It's a unique work of greatness, and uh, it would have been just too cosmic an injustice if a play this magnificent the last fading embers of Western greatness condensed into a magnificent play had not been received as it was, but happily it was. All right, with those introductory remarks, let us look at the plot theme and following our normal method, let us build it up a step at a time. <clears throat> what is this play about? Well, the first obvious answer is a hero, a great romantic hero. <clears throat> What is he after <clears throat> in action terms? What is his ruling continuous passion in terms of the play's action? His top value, obviously, Roxanne. His love for Roxanne, that dominates from start to finish. And what is his action in regard to her? Well, to make a very simple statement of it, he works to win her favor to woo her, to win her love. So we have the story of a great man working to woo his love. Now, if I stop there, that is what you would call a nothing situation. <coughs> the man loves a woman and tries to get her. There's no drama, no conflict, no excitement. Now we're trying to enter into Rostan's mind and see what kind of twist, what kind of gimmick, what kind of ploy would turn it into an immortal situation. Well, suppose, now I'm not saying historically this is the pattern Rostand went through, but just as we try to recreate his imagination. Suppose he would think, what if he tries to win her not for himself, but for somebody else? Well, for whom? Because it wouldn't be the same play depending upon who he tries to win her for. For example, Suppose Cyrano studied philosophy under a 60-year-old philosophic mentor whom he deeply respects, and he thinks that Roxanne would benefit a great deal from a relationship with this mentor who is more philosophically advanced than he, although the mentor isn't really interested and Cyrano tries to match make between the two of them. Well, he's trying to win her, but obviously this would be an entirely different play not very much drama, and pure self-abnegation on Cyrano's part. The question would be, why is he doing this? Now, Rostand, I put that in to show you that what a bad idea would be, so that by contrast, uh, Rostand's idea is he tries to woo her for his hated rival who loves her and whom he feels is beneath him. That is the key. He tries to win his beloved for his own rival. And so there is a conflict at the very inception. He's trying to win her for Christian. He wants Christian to win. But she is his beloved, and Christian is a fool. 
So he wants Christian to lose. So he wants him to win and he wants him to lose and he's torn down the middle. Now that is what you call a conflict. And without conflict, there is no drama. Well, now let's develop the situation. We still haven't reached the plot theme. We've just got a leg up on it. What might Rostand have thought further in developing this? And this is the hard part of creative writing, to get your plot theme. Well, uh, maybe his next question might have been, why? If Cyrano is in love with this woman, why wouldn't he pursue her on his own? Well, for some reason, he could, he's not suitable as a lover. We don't yet know what the reason is. Would it be, for instance, because he's already married? Well, that would be very conventional. And if that were the reason, you would doubt his real love for Roxanne, because if he was really passionately in love with her, he'd leave his wife in an instant. So we infer from that, projecting Rostand's uh, mental processes, there must be something intrinsic or internal to, to Cyrano, not external, something about him that disqualifies him from romance, something bad or flawed or wrong or unattractive, which he can't change. Now, if he can't change, we're, you know, this is the age far before plastic surgery, so you have to forget about that. It's not something spiritual. It's something unalterable given as, as a physical odiousness, a physical flaw of some kind that would make him odious to a heroine. And he has to accept this flaw as a 100% barrier. It simply eliminates him from the romantic contest. Now, there is nothing in this situation or in this play that it says it has to be a long nose. It could be any version of deformity. He could be a hunchback. He could be a leper. You, you could just exhaust your imagination by going to medical books. Rostand made it simple, uh, basing it on history, on the gargantuan nose. But that is merely a concrete, and if you were writing a paper on this and you said it was a story about a man with a long nose, you would fail automatically. The long nose is an incidental. It has a crucial purpose, but it's not a story about a nose. So let's put it like this. We have an ugly man. That's the way it's usually described, or physically deformed. A love, an ugly man, a hero, in love with a beautiful woman. Now, why do we want her to be beautiful? Well, if she too has a big nose, you know, maybe they'd get along okay. He's an ugly man in love with a beautiful woman who works to win her, not for himself, because that's impossible to him, but for his rival. Well, the rival then must be beautiful also, or handsome. He has to be perfect on the very count that Cyrano is deformed. But now Rostand would have to think, as he's developing his plot situation, why? Why would this beautiful rival need Cyrano's help? He's a perfect body, beautiful face. Why would he need Cyrano's help? Obviously, the body is not enough to woo Roxanne. Something spiritual is needed as well, which Cyrano has and Christiane does not. What is it? Well, it's not bravery, because Christian is every whit as brave as Cyrano. And you know, in essence, from the play, what is the trait that he picked that Cyrano had, that Roxanne wanted, and that Christian was miserable at being able to deliver. And, le and it can be described in many ways. Poetic sensitivity, or put more broadly, intellectual, aesthetic, literary mastery. Or put still another way, a quality of literate, brilliant soulfulness. He has a heroic soul with a tremendous ability to express himself in beautiful and dramatic, eloquent language. Whereas Christian, handsome as he is, is a simple, he's called a fool at one point, not in the sense that he's retarded, but completely ordinary, a nice guy, but whatever you say about him, he's inarticulate and he does not have a poetic soul. Uh, now, this much is necessary to make the plot theme real, uh, ring with a real dramatic situation. Here again is the plot theme about sending letters. 
letters are just like the nose. There's a hundred different ways they could have done it. They could have set the whole thing by phone, by computer. Uh, I mean, te the technology is infinite. It doesn't make any difference. The idea is not the means by which he woos or the flaw. The idea is this. This is the plot theme as I finally uh, reach it, and I'll dictate it to you. <coughs> a brilliant but ugly man in love with a beautiful woman, works to win her, dash, that's a punctuation mark, not for himself, but for his handsome and stupid rival. Now, stupid there is an overstatement, so you can put stupid in quotes. Not for himself, but for his handsome and stupid rival. We mean there by stupid, unaccomplished, perfectly ordinary, simple. A brilliant but ugly man in love with a beautiful woman works to win her, not for himself but for his handsome and stupid rival. Now you know that if the rival were also brilliant and poetic, that would finish the play completely because then Cyrano would have no asset in the struggle, he wouldn't be needed and the character just would be brushed aside. But here we have, and see if this suggests something to you on a deeper level. I don't mean to insult you. A brilliant intellect in a deformed body, and the other man has a beautiful body with the mind of a simple peasant. Does that suggest anything as a possible overarching philosophic thematic idea that might be a key to open the play. I heard someone say the mind-body dichotomy. What a guess! <laughs> <coughs> However, Rostan has a lot of tricks up his sleeve. This play is definitely the mind-body dichotomy, I'll tell you that right now, but not in the way you think, uh, unless you're one step ahead of me. Now, from the statement of the plot theme, if you recall, we are supposed to be able to figure out which are the essential indispensable characters and what are the main conflicts. And, of course, from this plot theme, we know right away that the Comte de Guiche is or is not a main character. Is not. Who are the main characters? Christian, Cyrano, Roxanne. Unfortunately, I used abbreviations, and Cyrano and Christian both start with C, and Rostand and, Rox and Roxanne both start with R, so I have to be on tiptoes throughout this whole thing now. Those are the three main characters, and that's all. It's a, it's a classic triangle. And what is the main conflict? Obviously, Cyrano versus Christian for Roxanne. Each wants her desperately, and, of course, you know Cyrano wants her desperately despite his actions. But that is just uh, conventional so far. Two men, both of whom want the same woman. What makes this a unique situation is that each is in a profound inner conflict. Each within himself is in a profound conflict. Cyrano wants her, but he doesn't want her. He feels that he cannot make her happy, that he must be loathsome to her, he still wants her, but he renounces her, but he still hopes. He wants to use uh, uh, Christian to gain her love, but he doesn't want to because he wants her to love him for himself. So, uh, uh, he is uh, in love, he is in conflict, and Christian wants to use Cyrano but he also wants to be loved for himself and not for um, the letters that he didn't write. So they're both in conflict for the same woman and they're both in conflict about the way they're winning her. And of course, they're both in conflict also against Roxanne. Neither of them want her to know and she wants desperately to know. So they have, she would want if she knew what the story was. So there's, a, there's an implicit conflict there that's crucial to the situation because the moment that Roxanne finds out, the play is over. If and when the ruse is exposed, uh, Cyrano can't then win her for Christian because then the jig is up. 
And if his premise is right about his own deformity being loathsome, he can't win her for himself, so the play would just peter out, there's no place to go. So that is the basic uh, plot theme, the basic situation. Now let's look to the plot uh, development. And uh, I always analyze plot development into three parts, and the first is what? <coughs> The establishment of the situation. And in the case of this play, that uh, uh, occupies which acts? One and two. Now, when you're doing plays, you should try and break them up if they're classic plays with a structure, because it makes it much more illuminating. You are given the information to create the basic situation. Then there's the rise to the climax. And then there's the denouement on the final resolution, how it ends. And in this case, one and two, acts one and two are the establishment, acts three and four are the rise, and act five is the denouement. So it has a perfect classic structure. So let's just look at these three parts that together are the way of implementing or carrying out this basic plot theme. Now you note the purposefulness of Ross Stand. Right off the bat, we learn of both men's undying love for Roxanne. And I like plays that put their cards on the table right away. Right off, as soon as they, but the duel hasn't even started, and you see already, uh, Rock, uh, uh, Christian tells us, I'm dying of love, I've got to meet her. And also right away, before it even comes up, I have no wit, I can't talk to a woman in the style that's necessary, I'm just a simple soldier. So everything you need to know about, about Christian, you're hit with right off the bat. Cyrano is introduced, a super brilliant, super artistic, poetic, but hideous with his long dangling appendage, although respected because of his courage and prowess with a sword. And he too tells us right off that he loves Roxanne but has no hope. And in fact, we find that one of the reasons that he orders Montfleury off the stage is that that fat pig had the presumption to love Roxanne. <clears throat> now, I want you to note here, as we're establishing the situation, this is a tricky situation to establish. Once a genius has done it, you read it and say, of course. But uh, there was a real problem which Rostand handles brilliantly, and that is, let us call it, the problem of the nose. The problem is, how does Cyrano view his own nose? Now, if he viewed it with pure despair or disdain or disgust and went around as a kind of humble, handicapped wretch thinking, oh, God, I'm, I'm grotesque. I just don't dare look in the mirror. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm deformed. He would become pathetic. He wouldn't be a hero, and the whole play would be a loss. You know, he'd end up at some government office applying for equal opportunity grant. <laughs> But that's one pitfall that Rostand had to be careful of. But on the other side, if Cyrano took the attitude, appearance is irrelevant. It's only the soul that counts. He'd simply go after Roxanne himself, and again, there would be no play. So he has to remain proud, arrogant, assertive, heroic, despite the nose, while at the very same time being conscious of the tremendous liability of the nose. Now that is a problem. He's got to be acutely aware of his, of his flaw while having an ex total, proud, righteous, arrogant self-confidence. And Rostand's solution is in essence Cyrano's exaggerated playfulness and inventiveness about the nose. He can beat anyone to insulting it and, and then defending it against attack. And so the very nose that his problem becomes a testament to his brilliance, his inventiveness, his sense of humor, his swordsmanship, his heroism. And at the very same time, all those qualities come across as infused with he is sensitive about his nose, 
He says that openly. He won't let anybody else talk about it. He regards it as an insult, and he will fight them to the death for such an insult. Now, this is, this, you know, once you see it on stage, you think it's enchanting, it's brilliant, but this had to be worked out as a combination, and you, the result is, he's a proud, heroic, extravagantly courageous, and acutely sensitive about his deformity all at once. And that is what the famous nose blad uh, brings off. Here's this genius denouncing his own nose. And it, it's brilliant. It's just, and if the, the person to see do it, of course you have Jose Ferrar on, um, uh, in the movie uh, version, but the, I've seen it quite a number of performances in Sierra Leone. The greatest by far is with Derek Jacoby, which I saw on Broadway, I think, in the 80s. And it was just absolutely breathtaking. Uh, a performance like none I have ever even uh, imagined. And it was just so real. It was completely romantic and swashbuckling, but at the same time so real that you believe that he's making up the couplets of this ballad as he's uh, doing it. You can feel his sensitivity and the bravado at the same time. Anyway, going on with the structure, uh, Act One closes with uh, Roxanne's need to see Cyrano, and of course then the hope, what could it mean, does she love me? Now, the establishment of the situation finishes in Act Two at Ragano's pastry shop. Roxanne confesses that she is in love, and there's two heartbreaking pages there, where we think and he thinks that it might be Cyrano. And she's pouring compliments on this unnamed man, and compliments that might be applicable to Cyrano too, until she says, and the best thing of all, he's beautiful. <clears throat> at which Cyrano turns pale because he knows that lets him out. She tells him it's Christian, and uh, he, he says, and notice Rostand is still eager to get the situation established at home. Uh, Christian had said at the beginning he doesn't know words, now we want to know that words really matter to uh, Ro Roxanne. So uh, uh, Cyrano says, but you only love words, wit, the grand manner. What if he's a fool? And she says with great sincerity, then I'll die. So what can he do? He can't have her. He pauses. He accepts the situation. She begs Christian, uh, Cyrano to protect Christian from the fiery Gascons in his company, and he agrees. And then her parting words are, be sure you haven't sent me a letter. You see, it's all being set up. We haven't yet established the situation, but it's all being skillfully put together. <clears throat> and then we have another nose scene, <clears throat> which is the meeting of uh, Christian and Cyrano, and which Christian baits him. He wants simply to show the Gascons his courage. And now we see the other side of Cyrano. He can't respond because of his promise to Roxanne, but he is impressed by Christian's courage and they get together. Uh, Cyrano with a letter to Roxanne that he had already written for himself to give her if there was a chance. And when he realized she loved uh, Christian, he didn't give it. Cyrano says to Christian, you must write her a letter because he had promised that to Roxanne. And Christian says, as by now we've come to expect, because it's been laid down, you see. It would fall flat if it was just out of the blue. But by now, he says, but I can't. And then there's this wonderful exchange where Christian says, I wish I had your wit. And Cyrano says, I wish I had your beauty. And then it's like, you know, the light bulb goes off. And the idea, let's get together. We each have one crucial ingredient. Together we will make one hero of romance. We'll win her together. Cyrano does not tell uh, um, Christian about his actual own love for uh, Roxanne. He says it's just a poetic challenge for him. So the situation is now perfectly established. And it took two long acts to make it completely convincing. The big problem was to get Cyrano's character right. 
uh, and then you could you feed in the points that are going to culminate in the establishment of the situation. So now we go to the uh, rise to the climax, and that's Acts 3 and 4. Act 3 is Roxanne's kiss. Now why do we see the balcony scene here? Why not just uh, flash letters on the screen and have Roxanne read the letters silently to herself and say, oh, how wonderful he is. Because this is theater. And the first thing you have to see is action. We have to actually watch Cyrano's wooing of Roxanne and see it succeed, see how it succeeds, see why it succeeds. And this is the first wave, the first rise in the overall rise of these two acts. The first obvious suspense line. Is he going to be able to win Cyrano and Christian, excuse me, Roxanne, or not? <clears throat> now, we learn that a number of letters have been sent and that Roxanne is duly impressed, but we want to dramatize the pursuit before our eyes and consequently the famous brilliant balcony scene. Cyrano is hidden at first, providing the lines and the stage whispers, and then finally he pushes Christian aside. It's just too clumsy a setup, and delivers them himself with Roxanne responding. <clears throat> now note again, Roxanne, this is what you call a really well-made play. He makes the points necessary to carry it out, because at a certain point you start to think to yourself, well, this is ridiculous. After some letters, why can't you just come out and speak? So he has Christian protest and say, I'm going to do it on my own. I don't need you anymore. The ice has been broken. And uh, I think uh, uh, Rostan does it very convincingly. Basically, this isn't the exact words, but basically, uh, Christian comes out and says, I love you a lot, kiddo. And that's <coughs> <laughs> that exhausts his repertoire. <laughs> so we see again that Cyrano simply has to take over for him and you're, you completely accept the situation. Now, this is all very calculated from the beginning to get you to this point. Now, uh, we have this scene where Cyrano, speaking in his own voice, that hidden in the darkness, declares his love eloquently, beautifully, soulfully, passionate. He's delivering lines for Christian, but the impact comes from the fact that he is deliver delivering them for himself first and foremost. And she, of course, is profoundly moved. She falls in love. I am yours, and you have made me thus. So for Cyrano, this is the ultimate triumph. And yet at the same time, it is total frustration. He has won for his rival, lost for himself. Then Christian demands a kiss. And Cyrano is definitely jealous. He does what he can to stop it because he wants her for himself. But he soon resigned. He sees that it's inevitable. It's inherent in the success of the plan. Christian is going to get it one way or the other. So uh, Christian climbs up the balcony and we hear Cyrano's tragic line. He's kissing my words. Uh, uh, she's kissing my words upon his lips which is a beautiful, eloquent, short, uh, uh, memorable way of taking a complexity uh, and, uh, and the image. You can see the, the pathos of the situation. It's triumph and tragedy together, and it's inherent in the pact. The scheme has worked. Christian, uh, Cyrano has made love to Roxanne, and now Christian cashes in. Well, is this the climax of the play? I've read accounts that say this is the climax because the, the purpose was supposed to be he wooed her, now he wooed and won her and sealed with a kiss. How many think that's the climax? Well, good for you. You're ahead of a lot of the critics. The climax <coughs> is, remember, the decisive event in the structure, the point when the ending is determined and knowable in principle when uh, the resolution of the conflict has actually taken place. 
It may not take place before our eyes, that could be in the denouement, but th that which will lead to it has finally been decided, and that has not happened here. First of all, from the nature of the story itself, if we are intelligent playgoers, we know right away that Christian's triumph must be very short-lived. Why? Do, can you imagine this set up? They get married and they go home and live together happily ever after raising the little kids. No, why not? <laughs> Somebody said because Christian has to talk at some point. Yes. <laughs> By the nature of the setup, she needs a brilliant poetic man, and he's the opposite. So uh, if they got married and spent day after day together, she would be bitterly disappointed. She'd realize that it was not this man who wooed her, and that would wreck the relationship, reveal the whole scheme, and the play would just peter out. The only way to avoid it is to keep her in ignorance of Christian's true nature once he gets her. And therefore, Rostand does the inevitable. You see, a great playwright does the inevitable in retrospect. That is, when we look back, we see he had to do this, and when, he, when you're reading it for the first time, it's completely unexpected. But you look back, you see the logic of his plot theme required this development. That is the test of a great structure. Rostand does the logical thing with Christian. They get married, and then he takes them off the scene as soon as he triumphs. Let them marry and then send them off to battle and let them die. And that way, she goes on thinking he's a noble poet and the play goes on. So they do get married and immediately uh, Cyrano and Christian are sent off to war away from Roxanne. And she begs Cyrano to be sure that Christian writes her every day. And then in Act 4, uh, Christian is killed. Now, this development frees us at last to focus on the really climactic question. The real suspense of this play, the climactic turning point, is not going to be, does Christian get her, but does Cyrano uh, get her? He is the one everybody is rooting for, in spite of the plan that he and Christian have cooked up. Cyrano is the hero. He is in love with her, and gradually we come to feel that she is really in love with him. So the rising action and suspense to the climax continues well into the fourth act, and that is already a great feat, to have an establishment which catches you up and then rise and then keep rising right through into the fourth act where you don't know what's going to happen <clears throat> until we reach an event that tells us once and for all what the outcome will be, and that event is the climax, right near the end of Act 4. And we get to it very logically. The cadets are in a desperate situation because de Guiche, the main villain, has in effect sentenced them to death through a hopeless battle. We also know that despite all the danger to his life, Cyrano has been sending letters every day to Roxanne, which have inflamed her passion for Christian even further. Finally, she can't stand his absence and comes to the camp herself to be with her husband. By the way, if Roxanne's spirit will forgive me, the standard criticism of this play is that it's completely unrealistic to think that a lover would come to the battlefield to meet uh, her, her husband, and that therefore, and many companies around the country simply omit large sections of Act 4 for, quote, realism. So that gives you an idea of the state of the world, if you had any doubts. <laughs> anyway, Roxanne comes to the camp to be with her husband. She realizes by this time something that we already know, that what she loves about him is not his face, but his letters. And then we have an exquisite scene where she begs Christian's forgiveness for being so light and vain and frivolous as to have loved him only for his body, only for his physical beauty. <clears throat> Even if you were ugly, she tells him, I'd still love your soul. That's what counts. <clears throat> she thinks she's showering upon him the deepest compliment. He gets the message and is devastated. 
because he realizes that she really loves Cyrano. And he puts this together with the information he's recently acquired that Cyrano risks his life seriously every day to send these love letters to Roxanne. So he realizes that Cyrano loves Roxanne. Cyrano and Roxanne are in love with each other. He finally gets it. And he, Christian, is the obstacle standing in their path. Now, simple as he is, he is a man of honor. One of the things about this play is the worst people have stature and honor. And uh, there's a wonderful exchange capturing the, the two antagonists' sense of justice. He's, the Christian confronts Cyrano with his information and says, shall I ruin your happiness because I have a cursed pretty face? That seems too unfair. And you're to take that as a, you know, pure statement of, it's just not fair that I get the lady when you have the soul that won her just because I was born with a pretty face. But Cyrano answers him in kind, and am I to ruin yours, ruin your happiness, because I happen to be born with power to say what you perhaps feel. Now that's a little more dubious whether that's an inborn skill, but nevertheless he's trying to see both sides and to be fair, I have a literary, let's say it's a, his professional specialization. I specialize in language. You don't, but that shouldn't be the, the fact. You see, they're both trying to be completely French uh, heroes. And Christian has a solution. Tell her. Tell her the whole truth. Let her choose between us. I want her to love me for what I am. And I think that's where he says, for the poor fool that I am or not at all. So Cyrano agrees and goes to tell her. And now your, your heart is in your chest because you think this could be it. This is, he's going to tell uh, the truth. She will pick him. And maybe it'll have a happy ending. Uh, you don't really think that if you know Ross Dan, but you, you, how you hope despite hope. And Cyrano says, so was it true what you said to Christian, that you would love him even... And she starts to say yes, even if he were ugly, and she can't get the word ugly out looking at him. And he says, the word comes hard before me, doesn't it? And then she says, no. And she gets her courage up. She says, even if he were ugly, grotesque, deformed. And uh, she's carried away by the love of the soul in those letters. And for one moment, Cyrano thinks it's true, but notice his first word after it's true. What's the first word after it's true? Perhaps. Perhaps. And then the next sentence. This is too much happiness. Now those are very instructive, and we're going to analyze those a bit later, but for a moment, he allows the possibility, even though it seems to him inconceivable, that uh, she loves him. So he says to Roxanne, listen, he's on the very verge of telling her, and at that instant, we learn that Christian is mortally wounded and dying. And what are Cyrano's first two words when he hears that Christian is dying? All gone. He tells Roxanne, I had nothing uh, to tell you. Um, he goes to the dying Christian and tells him, I told her, she made her choice, and it was you. You're the one she loves. He goes off to the final battle, thinking he's going to die in it, and he says, I have two deaths to avenge now, Christian's and my own. You'll have to forgive my alternating English and French pronunciation. I have Christian or Christian. Anyway, the climax here is clearly what? All gone. His climax is the decision not to speak. The instantaneous conviction, now I can never tell. I've lost her forever. At that point, we've reached the end of the suspense. We know how it must turn out. He's going to lose Roxanne too, and it'll be a tragic ending. Now, the whole question of understanding Cyrano and understanding the play is why does Cyrano 
take this decision at the climax. Once Chris John is dead, he's out of the way, why does Cyrano not speak up, especially if he believes that Roxanne really loves him? That is the question on which the meaning of this play depends. And it's not actually answered until when? You know? Well, it's not too hard to figure out because this is the end of Act 4. And you've given the answer in Act 5. <clears throat> but I'm going to postpone it, the answer to a, uh, for the discussion of Chris, um, Cyrano's character and uh, the theme. But you, what you have to keep in mind and think about is why does he behave this way at the climax? Is that inherent in the play, as if it's a great play, it must be? Or is that, you know, just a, a accidental, if it was accidental, of course, it would mean a horrendous flaw at the heart of the play. It wouldn't stand. It wouldn't be believed. But in fact, it has been thoroughly prepared and is the only thing possible given this play. Now, I'm not going to ask you to tell me, but just in a show of words, how many either feel or know that no other action by uh, Cyrano would have been possible at this point? Well, then the play comes to you to that extent. It's hard to articulate entirely why, but uh, not really when you get to it. Anyway, as far as structure, we're left only with the denouement and the final resolution, which is Act 5 at the convent. Uh, even though we've seen the, the climax and know how uh, the action will end, uh, we still have some questions that keep our suspense. Roxanne must learn the truth. How will she learn it? And how will Cyrano end up? Will he end up crushed? Or will his spirit somehow triumph even over his defeat? Now notice it's 15 years later, which is significant. She has been in a convent. She's given up the world. And Cyrano, too, we learn, has in effect lost the world. He's poor. He's threadbare. He's aging. He's alone. But he's still Cyrano. He's still true to his spirit and values. And he comes each Sunday to visit Roxanne and bring her the news. And on the way in Act 5, he is struck by this log of wood by some villain, which is exactly how the real Cyrano died. He is dying. Roxanne does not know. And yet Cyrano remains the same man, the same hero, the same spirit. We know at once how he will die, and we have left just the famous death scene. Roxanne has Christian's last letter always at her breast, and Cyrano says, I want to read it today, in parenthesis, because I am dying to, which she doesn't know yet. He starts reading, Farewell, Roxanne, because today I die. And it has a tragic double meaning, because it was written for Christian. She thinks it was Christian's last words, but it's also true now of Cyrano today. It's the same sentiment that he voiced then with the double meaning. And as he reads the letter, he, she focuses on the voice, and it's the same voice that was on the, that she heard once before in the balcony scene. And it starts to come back to her. He continues to read. It's too dark to see, but of course he has it completely memorized. And he goes on, and at last, she gets it, an extremely brilliant, dramatic, heart-rending way of her finding out. She says, it was you, it was your tears on the letter. And again, his, his gallant, uh, heroic comeback, the blood was his. Uh, and then she says, why tell me now? He said, well, I didn't f finish telling you the news. Today, Cyrano de Bergerac dies foully murdered. And she says to me, better than my synopsis, obviously, I love you, you must live. And he says, that's not in the story. 
You remember when Beauty said, I love you to the beast, that was a fairy prince. His ugliness changed and dissolved like magic, but you see, I am still the same. So Rostand is consciously saying that he drew the idea from Beauty and the Beast, which was a theme that goes all the way back in Western literature. But here the beast, the nose, the beast remains such to the end. So we were told something about it. Love can't prevent it. The flaw, whatever it is, is unavoidable. Unconquerable and unsurpassable. This is reality, not the fairy tale. And then we're going to feed that into the meaning. And then we have what I think is the single most uh, absolutely haunting and brilliant line in the play, Roxanne's line, I never loved but one man in my life, and I have lost him twice. If you can write a play that gets one line like that across, uh, you have made your claim to uh, immortality. You don't need more than one like that. I would read through 300 pages to get to one line like that. Uh, and then we have uh, Cyrano's final death throes uh, in delirium from his illness, He's lunging with his sword at the empty air, falsehood there, their prejudice, their compromise, cowardice, and so on. He's killing all of his enemies that he imagines are attacking him, and he says, there's only one crown that I bear away with me, and tonight when I enter before God, my salute shall sweep all the stars away from the blue threshold, one thing without stain, unspotted from the world, in spite of doom, my own. And that is... And she leans over and she says, that is, he opens his eyes and smiles at her, my white plume, and that's the curtain. Now, the white plume was a symbol uh, in the French army of courage, what we would call greatness of soul. It's kind of um, self-esteem with the style of life that expresses it exuberantly and heroically. And that's what he uh, took away w uh, from this world. That's, his, that's the one thing he has left. It is an utterly beautiful, utterly tragic. It's uplifting and, and uh, admirable. And at the same time, if you've followed and are immersed in this story, it's a very painful ending uh, to watch as this uh, truly great man dies tragically without uh, fulfilling his love. And you just sit there and cry, and the curtain comes down, and you go home and ponder, what was he telling us? Why does Christian uh, Cyrano have to die? Why does he have to die like this, losing everything? And that takes us to look at his characterization and his motivation, and then we'll finally emerge with the theme. So let's say a few words about Cyrano's characterization. He is really the only developed figure uh, to study. Uh, Roxanne and Christian get less, less attention from Rostand. They're much less complex. They're basically well-known types. But Cyrano is complex and extraordinary. He's a towering figure, one of the great historic figures of drama, with one of the worst defects, that is, his deformity. So, of course, the first thing that strikes you about him is the contrast between his great mind and deformed face. So, as I've mentioned, in some sense, you can safely say at the outset, Cyrano represents the soul-body dichotomy with Christian being the other side, the beautiful body and the ordinary mind. And together, as Rostan says, they make one perfect hero of romance. Now, the mind-body dichotomy in this play, however, is hard to explain. Because although it's definitely there, it's essential to the play, 
The character of Cyrano does not manifest that dichotomy in any obvious way. <clears throat> the paradox is this. Cyrano, as presented in the play, is the perfect union of the spiritual and the physical. He is a perfect example of the integration of the two, not the dichotomy. Now, if you were an ordinary guy and you wanted to present the mind-body dichotomy, you would be like 10,000 other playwrights. You'd have a spiritual, artistic, mystic, whatever type, who shrinks from the physical. Or you'd have some kind of brute materialist, if you're, or if you're left-wing, some money-grubbing capitalist who's empty and scornful of art and contemptuous of the spiritual. In other words, you'd show the person allegedly specializing in one side and disdaining or fearing the other. But Cyrano, although in some sense he's trapped by the mind-body dichotomy, represents both sides at their best. He is introduced from word one as at the same time a philosopher, a musician, a poet, and a swordsman. He is an artist and a soldier. He has great inner sensitivity and great physical strength and courage. In short, he is terrific in things of the spirit and in things of the physical. Both aspects of him are given equal stress by Rostand, and that's what makes him so charming. He's a great soul with a great power to act, a great power over and to control his body. And this is evident from the beginning of Act One, when he takes on the whole company to get Montfleury off the stage, does an act of extreme physical courage, and then throws a month's pay down to pay the owner with the statement, that's the kind of gesture I like. So he's, a, he's in love with drama. It's a thorough romantic uh, 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 gesture. And I think the sword fight to the Boab is deliberately, the purpose of that is to show the, the dual mastery of the physical and uh, the spiritual. He's a superlative dualist and a superlative poet. And you see the two of them in action on both fronts at once. So he himself describes himself at one point as a soul clothed in shining armor. And that is how he is actually portrayed. So he's the perfect mind-body integration. And um, it's, it's the complete introduction. Then as he ends the refrain, thrust home. His spiritual po poem comes to its climax and his physical action uh, together. Now, You'll have to read that speech. I haven't time for the tremendous wit and intelligence that he brings uh, about his own nose in the process. You know, was this the nose that launched a thousand ships? And he's got all these great lines. And Valver, the villain, says, you, know, you don't even have gloves. And he says, yeah, I'm sorry, I had a pair, and I lost one. Some gentleman offered me an impertinence, and I left it in his face. <laughs> so he is a wonderful character. I mean. Watching this on the stage is not an oppressive experience of tragedy. It's fun, it's enjoyable. Now, if uh, you wanted to go through Cyrano's character uh, consistently, from the point of view of the objectivist virtues, he has them all. He has every blessed objectivist virtue. And I'm not going to go you know, painstaking into them, but you obviously recognize his independence his integrity, specifically his creative integrity. It's the integrity of Rourke for his own work. And that is stressed by the scene in which uh, de Guiche, Cardinal Richelieu's nephew, and that represents like the highest level of the, uh, the, the establishment, says to him, let my uncle rewrite a few lines here and there of your play, and he'll approve the rest, and you can finally get it produced. And Cyrano wants to get it produced, and he has a marvelous speech, which I don't have time to read, but, but read it. No thank you is the speech. Um, uh, he wants to see his play produced, but what he wants is to see it produced as he wrote it, and his blood curdles at the thought of changing a comma. I mean, this could have been written by Ayn Rand. It's this exact same creative passion and integrity with the defiance 
of he will fight everybody, the lords, the establishment, the aristocracy, everybody, uh, for his truth, his way, his words, his way. And they tell him, you're an extremist. Now remember, this is written before the Goldwater Convention. <laughs> they tell him, you're an extremist, and he says, there are things in this world a man does well to carry to extremes. I mean, you could fall in love with this, with this man. He is just. That's what motivates his various battles. He's honest in everything except the scheme with uh, Christians, where they're deceiving Roxanne. He is productive. He's a soldier plus a playwright and poet. And there's no question whether he has pride, but he even has pride in the technical objectivist definition. You remember the objectivist definition of pride as moral ambitiousness. The man who seeks his own moral perfection across the board versus just trying to get some aspects right and say about flaws, well, there's nothing I can do about that, that yet that's just me. Cyrano states openly that his goal is, quote, to make myself in all things admirable. Now that is the very same idea as moral ambitiousness, to make myself, to shape myself in all things as admirable, good, right, perfect. Now this is true pride, and uh, he has it, and as a result of this absolutely unblemished character, he's a true friend, loyal, honorable, the opposite of any kind of uh, devious manipulator. You can say that his nose is his one area of personal doubt, which he does regard as a major liability, at least in regard to romance. You know, he, he says, I dream, and then I see the profile of my shadow on the wall, and then I have my bitter days, and I see how ugly I am. So that is the one, the one, the one problem that he has, but it does not seem to run into or dilute the rest of his character. Now, before we take our break, I have one question to ask about Cyrano's motivation in the whole scheme with Christian. Is he basically selfish or unselfish in entering the scheme with uh, Christian? Now, the standard line of commentators is that Cyrano is, guess what? The epitome of unselfishness. Uh, I'm quoting from one. We admire his self-abnegation. He is the exemplar of almost superhuman self-sacrifice. Now you get an idea of the abyss to which critical comment can lead you. I grant this much, there are mixed aspects to the play on this issue, which I'll get to after the break. But my first instinct is to say, if I hear a thing like that, nonsense. He is not unselfish. At least through Act 4, in my judgment, his motivation is completely selfish. First of all, he loves Roxanne passionately, and love, as you know, is thoroughly selfish. Plus, he believes it's metaphysically impossible ever to fulfill his love. He truly believes that the ugliness disqualifies him and that she's in love with, Christi with Christian. Therefore, the best thing possible to him, possible selfishly, is vicarious lovemaking through Christian. And his actual operative goal in the scheme is not to win her for Christian. Observe that he tries to stop Christian from kissing her, and later he's relieved when he hears that their marital consummation has been delayed. What he really wants, that's just the pretext, what he really wants is the chance to be himself with Roxanne, to pour out his soul, his feelings, and win her thereby, even if he has to remain hidden physically, even if it's only vicarious. At the start of the scheme, if you notice, and I think this is very conscious on Rothstein's part, he, uh, Cyrano says to Christian, when, you, when my words are on your lips, that will turn to fact my fantasies. In other words, this is as close as I can get, given the situation, to turning my selfish personal dream into a 
uh, reality. If he can tell her about his love and get her to respond, and this is the goal that motivates the letters and comes out clearest in the balcony scene. When he wins her, he's overcome by emotion, and he asks her, how can you know what this moment means to me? It's like a dream. And it, it is like a dream because it's his dream, as close as possible, coming true. His love comes tearing out of his throat, and she is responding, she's reacting, she is being reached by his voice, saying his words. And that is the fulfillment he has been seeking. And when she tells him, I am yours and you have made me thus, his answer should now become perfectly clear. His answer is, what is death like, I wonder? And what is the meaning of that? Now, he says it himself, I know everything else now. I have done this to you, I myself. In other words, I'm ready for death now because I have lived, I've achieved my goal, I can die now. Now this, I, as I see it, was Cyrano's self, selfish personal passion uh, that he believed could be satisfied no other way. So in this sense and to this point, I think there is no uh, question but that he is thoroughly selfish and that's what makes him admirable. <clears throat> now we get to the behavior in Act 4. He's about to tell her the truth after Christian uh, discovers it and demands that he speak and then at the last second Christian is killed and Cyrano's first words are all gone and thereafter he never tells her. Now why? This is the key to the meaning of the play and I think I'll take a break here for 10 minutes. <laughs> All right, let's pick up with the question, why did Cyrano take the attitude it's all gone and thereafter keep his silence and never tell Roxanne until he himself was dying? I think there are some lesser reasons before we get to the major one. Partly, I think his fear of his own ugliness and of her ridicule is never entirely conquered. Even in his moment of believing her that ugliness wouldn't matter to her, in other words, at the highest point in his physical self-confidence, the most he can say is, it's true, perhaps. Uh, God, this is too much happiness. In other words, it's just too much to be possible. It's, even here, he can't be 100%. It's just too good to be true. So I think you can say legitimately that in part, the reason he never speaks is that issue of his ugliness that motivates him throughout the play. But this is definitely not the whole answer, because after all, he was actually about to tell Roxanne, and then he stopped decisively when Christian died. So why? Now again, for some lesser reasons. In part, it's his very heroism, his loyalty to his dead comrade, his magnanimity. He can't see taking advantage of the situation. It, in effect, it would amount to talking bad about Christian behind his back when he's just died a hero's death. Because however you slice it, uh, if you imagine the scene taking place, he'd have to say in effect to Roxanne, you know, this guy was really a fool. All the things you liked were really me. And that would really sound awful on Christian's death scene in the face of her grief when the corpse is not even cold. And it would very probably even lack objectivity. If Christian had been alive and he had told her the truth, she'd come to him and say, is this true? And he would have said, yes. She would have believed it, but now he's dead. You can make up anything. There's nobody to contest it. And he's probably afraid that, uh, uh, you know, she might not even believe him. So. Up to this point, I can understand and ascribe it all to noble qualities, and I don't see any self-sacrifice. In other words, I understand it as a reticence or tactfulness of that immediate situation. It would be impossible on Christian's deathbed, or even, let us say, within a few months, while the grief is still intense. But here is what the question comes down to. Roxanne and Cyrano go on living for 15 years. 
two lives that are empty, wasted, love-starved. Cyrano knows it throughout and could achieve fulfillment for both of them. Despite his nose and his concern about that, he knows that she loves him. Because if you remember right after Christian's death, he said, I am dead and my love mourns for me and does not know. So he knows in some sense that she loves him. So why let her mourn? Why reduce her and him to this kind of arid, frustrated, not week or month, but 15 years? And imagine the number of empty nights in those years. Now, I don't think there is any way that you could call this anything other than an act of renunciation, an act of abnegation. Whatever else is operating, he is giving up the chance of personal happiness and fulfillment in a context where he has reason to believe it would be possible to him for no one's benefit, and thereby condemning himself to a life of misery and deprivation. And this is the decision made not in the heat of heroism, but in the coolness of years. Now, I just don't see that you can describe that as anything but a sacrifice. He's throwing away what they both want desperately for no rational reason. Now, I think this decision is the key to the deeper meaning of the play. There is a broader, deeper meaning that I think you, you feel, and that's why you can expect and sympathize with this decision, even though rationally it does not make sense. There's a deeper reason why he stays silent and renounces Roxanne, and that will lead us uh, basically into the theme. I, I'm not going to say anything about the other characters. Christian and Roxanne are very conventional, standard characters. Uh, there's nothing much uh, to say uh, about them, and rather than take the time there, I'd rather take the time on developing the theme. So let us jump to the theme. Now, the theme in this play is a bit tricky to define. And in fact, I loved the play for many years and had a lot of trouble trying to figure out what the theme was. It's not immediately obvious. So I'm going to lead you to the theme the way I was led to it. After you get to it, it seems really clear. But to get to it was, is tricky. I asked myself before trying to state the theme, let, what can I say about the theme that I'm sure is true? And I came out with three points that I know are indisputably involved in the theme somewhere. Then we try to put them together into one idea. And the first thought that occurred to me is that this play is first and foremost about the nobility of man, of one man, the greatness of, Cy of Cyrano, or let us say, the heroism of the great individual. The fundamental conflict of the play, thinking now on the thematic level, not the action level, is Cyrano, the exceptional, brilliant individual, against the establishment, the conventional daily world of society. In this regard, Cyrano's conflict is not primarily with Christian. Christian symbolizes the ordinary guy. He's not special. He's not a great individual. He's basically like everybody else. Christian is the representative of the conventional. True, he's beautiful. But the action of the play shows us that his beauty is to be regarded as a superficial, meaningless quality. What Roxanne discovers is that it's the character, the inner greatness of the man which counts. And so we have a picture of a great individual struggling heroically against the conventional world. Now, what does this remind you of as a theme? A great creative individual struggling the fountainhead. And that so far, it is the same idea as the fountainhead, with Cyrano, in effect, the counterpart of Rourke. But now, some crucial differences. Now, this is the second point that I thought of, and the first difference. Rourke is a success in existential terms. 
He achieves his values in the world. At the end, he's standing on top of his skyscraper with his beloved ascending toward him. Cyrano, by contrast, is a tragedy. He does not achieve his values. He doesn't succeed in his work as a dramatist, and he never gets the girl. He never unites with Roxanne. The tragic thing about him is he wins all the battles, but he loses the war. At the end, he is spiritually intact, but existentially defeated. Impoverished, alone, in failing health, and he himself says, I have missed everything. Now that is a, a big contrast, obviously, with the fountain. Now, why his defeat? What is the difference here between Cyrano and Rourke? Some flaw is blatant in Cyrano that Rourke doesn't have. It's not the nose per se, but let's call it the nose for a minute. There is some kind of soul-body dichotomy operating in the theme of this play. Some kind of idea that the spiritual and the body or the physical point in opposite directions that you can be great in one realm, but a beast in the other, a success in one and a total failure in the other, that there is a metaphysical conflict between the two and that it can lead to your defeat. Now, obviously, in this conflict, Rostand takes what side? Rostand himself, the spirit. He takes the view of the spirit as superior to the body, you know, the soul above the physical and thus Roxanne's apology to Christian for loving, quote, the mere costume, the poor casual body you went about in. Now, obviously, this soul-body dichotomy is related to the tragic ending. Now, look for a moment just to the love story. We have a situation where neither male is a full man, metaphysically speaking. One is a brilliant spirit in a deformed body, the other a beautiful body covering an undeveloped spirit. So each is like only half a man. And as such, neither can hope to win Roxanne. Each is doomed to lose and end tragically, and which is why they both have to die without enjoying the love. Now that's what you can call the nose uh, interpretation, that this is basically a love story, and Cyrano has a flaw because he's only half a man, and so is the other guy only half a man. I do not think that is deep enough at all. I don't think that does justice to the play. It's there, but it's an element of a much broader and deeper theme. The issue in this play, I believe, is broader than the love story. Nor do I believe that the nose is the tr basic tragic factor in the play. Rostand was a great romantic playwright. I just cannot and do not believe that he would make an accident of birth the downfall of his character. After all, the size of your nose is unrelated to philosophy, character, or life. It's just your genes, or whatever Ross Stan would think. He knows it's, it's a birth product. It's not a product of, of his character or soul. I, I, Ross Stan is not that superficial. As a romantic, I don't think that he would ascribe Cyrano's failure or frustration to the accident of an inborn ugliness. It's just too superficial. I'm not saying the nose is insignificant. Cyrano with an ordinary nose would not be Cyrano, but it's not a primary. So we need to find some other way to explain what is the message, why does Cyrano fail, what is the real meaning of the nose. Now, the true explanation is given actually point by point in Act 5, if you read it like a detective. It's like Rostand is laying out his thought almost syllogistically. Now, we don't have time for me to read all the passages, but I suggest I will give you here the highlights, and then you read those passages and see how they are set up one for the other to emerge with a total meaning. I'll give you the page number and the edition I have, which is the modern library you probably do. Uh, in page 292, we read that Cyrano, in his satires, attacks everyone. And they go into all the different categories. False nobles, false saints, false heroes, false artists, 
In other words, he is not simply a literary precious uh, that has a new style or attack one element of corruption in, in the religion around him. He attacks the, the representatives of the establishment of society throughout. And in the next page, we find out that he does this. And of course, we've seen that, not out of hostility or nihilism, but as a matter of integrity, of being true to himself. And he is described as he lives his own life, his own way, thought, word, and deed. Now, so he's at odds with the totality of his, his environment. It's his spirit versus that environment. Now the question is, is it just an accident of the era that Cyrano lived in? Is it just, is Rostand's view that the establishment happened to be corrupt at, th at this period because men misused their free will? If so, you could have you know, a tragic ending, but it would still be metaphysically, this is not a proof of the nature of life. I am afraid that that is not Rostand's view and that he is very explicit in telling you how to interpret the clash between Cyrano and the establishment. He had a much deeper metaphysical meaning and a really key speech here, which I'll just take a second to quote a sentence from, which is on page 294, uh, which uh, is a truly uh, mystifying speech if you don't get what he's after. And this is by de Guiche, the villain, being good, that is, he's, he's telling his honest feelings. And it's like he's reflecting on something that he's known all his life, and he says in essence, do you know when a man wins everything in this world, when he succeeds too much, now right away my ear pricked up too much, huh? well why would there be too much success? Well maybe he's done unscrupulous things in the very next line. He feels having done nothing wrong especially. He succeeded too much but done nothing wrong. He feels somehow a thousand small displeasures with himself. It's not quite remorse but rather a sort of vague disgust. And this is from succeeding too much while doing nothing wrong. He ends up with a feeling of dry illusion and vain regrets. And uh, Roxanne says, the sentiment does you honor. Now there is a, is a statement that's taking us into another domain, that success inherently demands some kind of demeaning some kind of compromise, some kind of capitulation to the world. That being true to yourself inherently means foregoing success in the world. At this point, we are being told that there's a metaphysical conflict between your moral character and your worldly goals. It's one or the other. The play is uh, here taking the turn that it's not illustrating a corrupt society, but life as such in the universe. And there is substantial further evidence of this. And this is where you have to read like a detective. He's just, uh, Cyrano has just been ambushed by a lackey as against a noble death on the battlefield, which is what he had always wanted. And what is his comment? He says, it seems too, what? Too logical. I have missed everything, even my death. Now that to me speaks volumes. Because on the objectivist metaphysics, a great hero like Rourke, who gains everything when he's on the top of the skyscraper would say, you know, he might conceivably say, this is just too logical. I got it all, including Dominique riding up the elevator. But that would be logical to him because it's life as it is metaphysically. It's the complete fulfillment of benevolence. But from Cyrano and Rostand's perspective, a great hero who loses everything, even his death, is what is to be expected. That is the perfect logic 
of the metaphysical situation. That is the way life is, and it delivered in spades for him right down to the manner of his death. Now, another piece of evidence for this, which is very, very crucial, but goes by fast, is the reference to Moliere. You remember Moliere stole a scene word for word from Cyrano, and the crowd roared, they loved it. Now, observe what Cyrano says when he learns of this, of the Moliere having taken it. Yes, that has been my life. Now, he immediately combines in his mind what Moliere did to him with Christian as two examples of the same point. And as he explains it, Christian stood under the window and won Roxanne's applause and the kiss while he, Cyrano, was relegated to the darkness. And now Moliere is doing the same thing in the professional arena, winning all the applause while Cyrano is obscure and unknown. Now the juxtaposition of these two is crucial because Moliere has nothing to do with Cyrano's nose. We're given three values in this scene that Cyrano loses and bewails having lost. Roxanne, his play, and, uh, and the style of his death. And the last two have nothing to do with his nose. What is common to all three is that Cyrano does not achieve the values his great spirit entitles him to win. And even worse, in all three cases, it's his greatness of spirit that does him in, in the world. Christian borrowed his greatness of spirit, and so did Moliere. They took over his spiritual assets and converted them to their own ends, while Cyrano, for his spirit, gained not fame or love, but the hatred of everyone, and finally died ignobly because of it. Now, what is common to Christian and Moliere that enabled them to win through Christians, through Cyrano's assets? It was not that they're both beautiful in body because Moliere's appearance doesn't even enter into it. What is common is what? They both belong to this world. They fit into the world. They're conventional. One does farces and one is a simple soldier. They belong. They're part of the crowd. And Cyrano does not belong because of his untamed greatness. He is the true spiritual individualist, an utterly unique personality and soul who repels the people who fit in, and that destines him to defeat. In other words, the real liability of Cyrano, judged by this passage and by the overall action, the real liability is not his body, but his soul, his spirit. It is too good, too outstanding, too unique for this world and men as they are by their nature. And that, I think, is the meaning of the play. The nose is not a primary, but merely a visual symbol of Cyrano's uniqueness. His soul makes him an outcast among men, and his nose is like a visual dramatization of his being an outcast. It is a visual reflection of something that sets him apart and causes others to scorn him. But what they really oppose is not his nose, but his independent soul. Or I would, I would put my view this way. Cyrano is not an outcast because of his nose. His nose is deformed because he is an outcast on a much deeper level, the level of the soul or the spirit. And thus, on page 318, when he mentions his two soulmates, who are they? Out of the whole of history, who are the two soulmates that he, that he mentions at death? Socrates and Galileo. And what is the bond among the three as he sees it? All of them were condemned by the world for their greatness. And it's not an issue. Socrates is ugly, Galileo wasn't. It doesn't have to do with that. Socrates was forced to drink the hemlock. Galileo was forced to recant. And what stands out in his memory and ours of that trinity is they did not fit 
their contemporaries and were punished for it. Or put metaphysically, as I think Rothstein sees it, they were simply too good for this world. They could not achieve success here on Earth. And that's why what Cyrano has left at the end, his white plume, is purely spiritual. He leaves behind no achievements, but what is intact is the purity of his soul. So the soul-body dichotomy, in my opinion, is crucial, but not in the literal form of Cyrano's mind versus Cyrano's body. It's in the much deeper form of the soul versus the material world. The human spirit or the spirit of greatness versus metaphysical existence itself. The nose is merely an example, a concrete, a symbol of the whole physical universe in which a noble soul is doomed. So I have to tell you that I would define the theme as follows. So this is pretty heavy, but that's what I think it is. The heroic free spirit as an outcast in the physical world. The heroic free spirit as an outcast in the physical world. That's what I would say is the theme that all the events add up to. And obviously, this is a form of very profound, malevolent universe. And this, to me, is the deepest explanation of why Cyrano never goes after Roxanne, even after Christian dies. He does not believe metaphysically that he is entitled to his values. He doesn't ultimately believe that success can be his. He will fight. He will fight courageously, but he expects to lose. And I think this was Rostand's personal conviction, and I think this is what disarmed Rostand and therefore Cyrano. It's like a metaphysical disarmament. Reality is set against a noble soul. And that leaves you vulnerable to any corrupt moral code, including somebody demanding self-sacrifice or renunciation. Because on that metaphysics, you feel that renunciation is your destiny anyway by the nature of life. Now, just as added confirmation, you might be interested to know that defeat or tragedy is universal in Rostand's works. Uh, Cyrano, of course, is the case of a man whose nobility serves only to win his beloved for another man. Leg lawn, which means the little eagle is about Napoleon's unhappy and consumptive son. And one commentator describes him as the sickly boy who knows he can never achieve the heaven-storming strength of his father, the eagle Napoleon. And Chanticleer, you know, he's the strutting cock, the protagonist, who believes that his crowing causes the sun to rise. And he was forced in the end to learn that it doesn't that is really impotent to alter the sun's course. In short, you have throughout Rostand protagonists more or less heroic, certainly none that equal Cyrano, but doomed uh, to failure. Now I'd like to say a few words in conclusion on the basic overall philosophy that would lead to this kind of theme This play, in my view, is a synthesis of two utterly antithetical views or philosophies. And it's, it's as, as, as a clashing a play, in this sense, philosophically, as I have ever seen. It's Christianity plus Romanticism. Now, that combination has been around a long time. But here you have the extreme of each united in one play. Well, Stand is obviously not a philosopher, but he was obviously drawn to both perspectives. Now that Christianity is blatant in the theme, Christian literature is full of stories about saints being outcasts in this world. And that is the real spiritual material dichotomy. You know the saint burned at the stake 
for the greater glory of God. The body doesn't count, this world doesn't count, he has a nobility, uh, etc. But now, in the traditional Christian literature, an entire ascetic way of life went with this kind of piety, involving sacrifice, poverty, passivity, obedience, not developing your faculties. Remember, Augustine thought that it was a crime to develop your faculties and go out and observe the world and study. That he called the lust of the eyes. So Christianity was consistent. It said, renounce the world, and it really said, become mindless, blind, obedient, starve, drink laundry water, burn at the stake, and then you'll get your glory in the next life. Now, Rostand, in effect, took the sense, the defeated sense of this life, of this Christian approach, but threw out the otherworldly saint and put in his place a thisworldly 19th century individualistic romantic hero. He gave the filling, the content, the protagonist, a man of the post-Renaissance world who holds that this life is good, the man has free will, that he, that he determines his future, that there are crucial values at stake here on earth, that it's important to fight for your values, that you should have a whole code of secular virtues, independence and integrity and justice and so on. In this respect, he is not a person who dismisses life, but relishes that. And you can see it in the play, in Cyrano's tremendous efficacy. This man can do anything superlatively. He can write, he can love, he can fight. He enjoys life. He enjoys the worldly things about life. He revels in all the worldly virtues, the virtues of efficacy. So we have a tremendous anomaly, a profound ambivalence here, a romantic, secular, worldly view of life and hero juxtaposed with a metaphysics demanding Christian renunciation. And therefore, if you press it, I, I simply don't think the overall philosophy of this play is coherent. And the clash, I think, is mirrored in the genre. Uh, Rostand calls this play a heroic comedy. And it is comedy, and it's a good-spirited, exuberant comedy. And that, I think, flows from the pro-life element. It's not the comedy of sneering at values or a comedy of like Moliere where you see pratfalls, etc. It's the comedy of innocent laughter, the laughter of men who enjoy life. It's full of clever lines, brilliant witticisms, delightful scenes such as Ragano with his cherished poems on paper ba bags and so on, the, the intellectual baker. It's funny, it's fun, and it's like Cyrano's own wit about his nose. In this sense, the play is filled with high spirits. And when you watch it, it's not an emotional drain or disaster. It's, it's a pleasure to watch. So that's the comedy. And yet, against this setting and style, there is the basic storyline, which is the very opposite. The tragic story of Cyrano and his defeat in the world. It's a heroic comedy, said Rostand, and the heroism is, in effect, the tragedy. The greatness of Cyrano with the thematic implications. So you can see, I think, Rostand's split in the very genre. It's as though he wants to express the pleasure and suffering of life at once, as though he himself is ambivalent, and the play, therefore, is a union of that which can't be united. Now, to me, the deepest tragedy of this play is that a character as noble as Cyrano, with his exalted and efficacious spirit, has to see himself as in opposition to reality, because that's what it amounts to, and therefore as defeated in the end. And I think what it means is that Rostan still subscribed to the most lethal tenets of traditional Christianity, even though, like the whole 19th century, he was no longer religious in the medieval way. And the lethal tenets that he still preserved, malevolence, the soul-body dichotomy, the nobility of renunciation. In other words, what Rostand had was only a sense of life for this world. He had the romantic sense of man and life, which was a legacy from Aristotle. 
but it was combined with an implicit, entrenched Christ Christian viewpoint, and that left him helpless. And this is like a microcosm, because I think the whole of modern literature has been tragic in this larger sense. It's what you could call the plight of modern man or the modern hero. He loves this world, not God. He wants his own happiness, not suffering. He wants greatness here, not in heaven. But he doesn't know how to attain his earthly values. He feels he has free will, but he has no guide as to how to remake his soul. Even the Renaissance itself, you probably know, was a skeptical period. They'd given up rule by religion, but they had nothing to replace it. They didn't know with certainty, therefore, what to do, what to aim at, or how to succeed. And I think we have that same tragedy that's repeated itself century after century here in Cyrano. A hero of wonderful stature with all the virtues, except he does not re-identify deliberately the underlying philosophy that he has absorbed, and therefore he's overcome by the traditional sense of life as tragedy. Given his genius, Rostand created a magnificent play here. It's my own all-time uh, favorite play. And given his intellectual legacy and the fact that he was not an original philosopher, I don't think anyone could have done the job better. In that sense, I think we have to always feel grateful to him for the experience of reading, or if you possibly can, seeing this play. Even with its ideological flaws, I feel safe in predicting that so long as the human spirit survives, this play will go on being performed, even someday in Atlantis. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for attending my lectures, and I wish you the best for the future. My mini course on reading and writing is now concluded. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we have time for 10 minutes of questions, presumably on Cyrano, but yes. How much of this analysis of uh, Cyrano is your own, and how much uh, do you know that Ayn Rand agreed with? I never discussed the theme of Cyrano with uh, Ayn Rand, believe it or not. I was a monomaniac about philosophy. <laughs> And I was always wanting to know, are the senses valid, and how do you form concepts, and so on. I, I literally almost never discussed, the only play that I ever discussed with her in really tremendous great detail for hours was Othello, because I had to teach it and couldn't understand it. And we went over that, you know, and I have whole notebooks of comments, but I never did, I know that she loved Cyrano as a play, and she thought it was a magnificent creation of man of integrity. Uh, I, I believe that she would accept this because it's compatible with many things she's written about art and about romantics, but I didn't get it from her. John. Uh, the, the use of the term panache, which you so often hear in the description of Cyril, is that just kind of modern? Oh, John, isn't that wonderful? I had a whole section on panache, <laughs> which I cut out because I didn't have time. And now you're going to just hear an extemporaneous <laughs> comment on panache. Uh, panache is actually the last word of the play in French. Now, literally, a panache is the tuft or plume of feathers of an old French military helmet. And that's why it's often translated as white plume. More broadly, it's taken symbolically to mean, and this is the typical list of qualities that it's taken to mean, pride, gallantry, swagger, courage, conceit, and conscious superiority. Now, that's quite a mixture, but that's the, the list. Rostand himself wrote a passage in French defining it, which I translated word for word. 
Unfortunately, it is not what you would call a definition by essentials, but it was a concept that he meant. This is what I got out of the translation, and I looked up every blessed word in it. He says it's not just greatness, but something added to greatness. And then the adjectives that Rostand himself includes are, with this you're getting special benefit, it's never been translated. Whether this is the correct translation is another question. It's something added to greatness, something courageous, articulate, theatrical, dramatic, forceful, and strong. Those are the adjectives that uh, Rostand uses. Obviously, articulate is very central to that. A dramatic, it's, it, it's, a, it's a, an issue of substance and style. You could not be a man of panache if you are a silent, repressed hero. To be a man of panache, you have to be like Francisco, you know, with the romantic gestures and tremendous articul articulance, articulateness uh, beyond being uh, uh, courage. You have to, there has to be something theatrical with a flair to it, to have uh, panache. And now what is really, really to me was interesting is that um, the, uh, it, this goes to show that it's a perfectly logical universe. Rostand says in passing, which no one ever mentions, that the man of panache is never disinterested. Because he says, even when the man of panache makes a sacrifice for his values, he has a satisfied attitude about himself. His action is interested or self-concerned. He enjoys, you see, taking pride in his courage and showing fierce loyalty to his values. So he's self-oriented even when he's sacrificing. Whereas, says uh, Rostand, the man without panache, when he sacrifices, is a pure example of self-abnegation, and he obviously doesn't like him. So um, uh, it, it, it meant for Rostand a kind of soul there is no English for, because panache, unfortunately, suggests like Marie Chevalier or you know, some, some unreal. It has to be a combination of spiritual power and articulate, dramatic style. Francisco would be the closest to having that kind of character of any Ayn Rand character uh, that I can think of. Not Reardon, you see, because he has more of the repressed exterior. I'm so glad you, because uh, I did all that research and went to the library. At the very end of the play, when uh, Cyrano is fighting his, his vices and delirium, he uh, says, uh, Ah, you too, vanity, I knew you would overthrow me in the end. Do you see that as having relevance to the theme? Well, I take that that it was the false, the pseudo self esteem of his enemies you know, Cardinal Richelieu and the court and so on, who regard themselves as superior to the, to the masses. Uh, you know, the uh, traditional dichotomy was it was vanity, pride, and humility, and pride was the virtue. So I take that as being, he, he throws it in with cowardice and so on as a standard vice, but I take it that it, I do not t take it as meaning my self-esteem was too high, no. Now I'm trying to get different people. Yeah, I think at the very back. Did you discuss the two movies? I'm sure I didn't hear that. Did you discuss your opinion of the two movies? Two movies. Of the two movies, what's the other one? The 1952 or so. That's the, that's the Jose Ferrar, and the other is the Depardieu, you mean? Uh, yeah. Well, I, I never really can give you an honest opinion of the Depardieu movie because I couldn't watch it. I found it boring. Uh, they did not bring out, in the part I saw, uh, it, it, it antagonized me, it did not bring out the essence. They played it all down and flat. And Cyrano has to be played with a huge swashbuckling style. It has to be believable, but it has to be high romanticism. You cannot make it, you know, the Frenchman next door. <laughs> and uh, that, so it's really unfair for me to comment, but I, I tried to watch it. But I tell you, uh, and I don't want to take away from this movie tonight, I saw this movie, in fact, this movie meant so much to me growing up that 
I lived in Canada, 60 miles north of the border, and we didn't even get many movies. We would drive down to Minnesota or North Dakota to see this movie as teenagers uh, because it was such a fabulous, uh, I mean, I grew up with that as the idea, as the escape. That was United States to me and what life had to offer as opposed to Canada. So the Farrar movie has, a, a, it certainly is extremely well done. I do want to say, if ever you get a chance to see the British company that has Derek Jacoby in it, try and see that because that is, you know, the, first of all, it's always, a play is always better on the stage than in the movies. It's written to be a play. And uh, the movies can't entirely capture it. They can compensate to some extent but you can't get what a play is. And I like the, the play form better than the movies. But I never thought I would see anything that was as utterly perfect as that. Uh, if I had been able to get tickets, I would have just come to every performance for the run. Uh, I did go back to see it twice, and I have a treasured T-shirt that says Derek Jacoby as uh, Cyrano, which I don't even wear because I don't want it to fade out. <laughs> All right, I'll take one last short one. Uh, yes. Cyrano says all gone at the climax. I uh, took that to mean that Cyrano believed true love, his true, true love was possible if he had a perfect mind and a perfect body and the perfect body died there. And well, you're, you're not on the same wavelength as I am then because I don't think he thinks true love is possible. Not to be consummated. True love as a passion, yes, but to be consummated in this world I think that's the issue, again, of being an outcast. Okay, well, thanks again very much. Thank you.